Oh, hey, come over and look at our clock. Do you see our clock? Isn't that interesting how there's not a 12 there? There's not a 12 there because, of course, there's a camera there. That was a nice dance you did. I think I dropped something. Nice dance you. And God comes and says, the moment that money drops, my instincts are to say, mine. But then this thought goes through my head. Dang, I could get caught. And so i got to give the money back. This is Glaucon's question. Put it in your notes. It's the question of the myth of Maverick. It's a question I think every student should have to contest with. It's one of the most disturbing questions in the history of questions. And it's this question. Glaucon asked the old man Socrates, Can you give me a reason why I should ever give that money back assuming I will never get caught and punished for taking it either in this life or the life to come see there may be some of us that were raised with certain understandings of morals that is to say I can't take that money because when I die there's this thing called Dante's Inferno and guess what Thieves go to Dante's Inferno, and guess what? It ain't a pretty picture. We've read that storybook, okay? And with that in mind, I'm going to go ahead and give the money back. Not because I want to give the money back, but because I don't want to go to Dante's Hell, to Dante's Inferno. But Glaucon asked this question. If, if you could be promised absolutely that you will never go to any kind of punishment, either in this life or the life to come, the other reason Glaucon says you might give the money back is you give the five bones back hoping she'll give you one of them. In other words, reward. Like, hey, lady, you dropped your money. And she goes, oh, that was very kind of you. I could have lost five grand. Here, why don't you have a thousand of this? Because it's a reward. And you go, yes, it paid off. Socrates is asked by Glaucon, what if there's no promise of reward, either in this life or the life to come, either? Can you give me any reason why I should ever give that money back instead of keeping it? Socrates goes, that's a hard question, but that is not a hard enough question. And Glaucon's like, that is not a hard enough question. That is not a hard enough question. I want to make it even more difficult. And this is how Socrates says, I even want to make it more difficult. I'm going to say two things. One, you'll give the money back every time, no matter what. No matter what. Let's say, for example, you got three starving children at home. You could really use this money. Got to give it back anyway, every time. Socrates says, I want to make that argument. God kind of like rolls his eyes and he goes, you said two things? What's the second one? The second one is, every time I give the money back, I want to make the argument that you're really happy about doing it. No, I mean like really happy. Like so happy that you're just like giddy. Like, yay, I get to give this back to this lady. Cloud kind of goes, and you're talking about no promise of punishment or reward, either in this life or the life to come. Right. Cloud kind of says, dude, here's the thing. I remember I was doing this gig. I, 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 I sometimes share this story elsewhere. I was doing this gig in a prison. No, with a bunch of cons, right? And when they walked me in, for example, they, you know, they kind of said like, okay, here are the exits, and you know, those guys with 12 gauges, they'll take care of you. you know? And I'm like, dude, really? Are you serious with me? And I'm telling the story, just like I told it to you guys, right? And I said, the mo you know, money floating to the floor. And somebody out of the back shouts, money's mine! And then everybody laughed. And I kind of waited until it all kind of got quiet again, and then I looked around and I said, is there not a little bit of irony in the fact that we're in a we're in a jail, in a prison, where you took the money and then you got caught. And then they all, you know, like, oh yeah, you're right, yeah, I'm half, yeah. That's kind of wild. Here's, the, here's the, the Glauconian question, though. For Socrates, he wants to make it even more demanding. Is there a reason why you'd give the money back every time, regardless of whether there's any kind of promise of reward or punishment in this life or the life to come? Socrates will say, I can answer this question, but it's going to take a while. That I would write down in my notes. The answer is obviously worth our time, or I wouldn't be lecturing it to you now. It's, a t it's an answer that has transcended a long period of time. In fact, it may be one of the most important single answers ever given. Okay? Our challenge now is to hear Socrates' answer. Put it in your notes. It's going to take him Republic 2, 3, 4, five, and six before he finally comes to his legit answer in Republic 7. Republic 7 is called the cave allegory. And readers of the Republic, if they know any part of Republic, they know this book 7, the cave allegory. Okay? 
What we want to do is we want to work now quickly through books two through six. All right? So that by the time we reach book seven, we have some sense of what's going on. Book two. Socrates plays a little game. He imagines this question. What if I held up here, I won't do it, but what if I held up here a little postum sticker with some words on it and I asked the person at the back of the room to read it? They would go like, ah, oh, your handwriting, I can't read it when I'm looking close at it, much less from the back of the room. But then what if I put a huge poster up here with the same words? Which of the two signs is easier to read? Self-evidently, Glaucon says, the big sign. Socrates says you're right. See, because if I have a big sign versus a little sign, yes, I can read much easier the big sign. So Socrates asks a simple question. Let's look at the big sign. The ideal republic or state or group of people. Once I can tell us a little bit about what that is in regards to justice, what is the ideal state, then we'll extrapolate back to talk about the individual. Now this is an important analogy, so put it in your notes. Socrates is going to argue that in some way, the group of people, sociology, is kind of like the individual person. Now whether that's true or not, we're going to have to debate. But first we have to hear his argument. So he asks a simple question. What is the perfect group of people? Let's start with a family. What kind of family do you want to live in? Do you want to live in a family when you were five? Do you want to live in a family that in the morning when it's time to get ready for school, somebody comes busting through the door and jacks you really bad, drops a couple of terrible words on you, beats you up, and then sends you to kindergarten? Or would you rather live in a perfect family where people treat you nice and kind? Now that will be our question when we come back. What kind of family would you like to live in and how do you construct it? Hmm. Thank you.